Hello everyone, welcome to Ace Psychology. Today we are going to be talking about Schachter and Singer. This is a study in the biological approach and we are talking about emotions. So stay tuned and we will go through the entire study. Okay, so the background of Schachter and Singer. We are talking about the two-factor theory of emotion. So try to remember Schachter's two-factor. That's how I remember it. Anyway, um, so this two-factor theory of emotion says that we label our emotions based on two factors. Okay, the first is our physiological. So what type of arousal is going on in our body? Are we sweating? Do we have increased heart rate? And then our cognitive appraisal. So this just means we are appraising our environment or we are looking at the clues our environment is giving us to somehow label that emotion. So um, here's an example. So you're in school and you walk into your of uh, fifth period math class and your heart automatically drops so instantly you're looking around and everyone's cramming and you forgot that there was a test today so you're gonna go ahead and label that as anxiety maybe depends who you are fear um, now let's take that same physiological feeling so you walk into your fifth period math class and uh, your heart drops, but this time you look around and your crush is actually sitting in the seat next to you after the teacher has just reassigned seating. So now it's not anxiety and stress in a way that you're going to fail a test, but maybe there's a little lust and um, anxiety in there. So we have to take into consideration that we may have the same physiological arousal and be labeling those emotions differently depending on our environment and that is exactly the two-factor theory of emotion you can look at the cannon bard theory and the james lang theory um, that is just comparable in my class i usually do like a socratic seminar so we can investigate the different types of theories there's um m many theories i believe there's six as, as when i was teaching there were six so why don't you look those up um try to tell the difference between them um, and maybe you can get a better concept of what this two-factor theory of emotion is. Okay, so let's get on to the study. Okay, so in like any other study, we have to look at the methodologies. So let's go through some of the important details of Schachter and Singer. So we have 185 male college students. They are also white, so we have an ethnocentric bias. We have a gender bias. Um, there were actually only 184 that went through the entire experiment, um, but it's still written in the books that there were 185. Now, these were psychology students, so there was some incentive to be part of the study, so we also have to keep into consideration the motivational bias. Um, our methodology, we have a laboratory experiment, we have observations, self-reports, questionnaires. We'll go and hit all of those um, when we talk about the procedures of the study. Um, our design, we have an independent group's design. So what that means is our participants only experienced one level of the independent variable. So um, I'm jumping a little ahead, but so if they received an, inje an injection of adrenaline and they were put in the euphoric classroom um, and they were told about their symptoms and that's the only um, phase that they experienced if we would have had a repeated measures design, it would have skewed the data because our participants would have kind of already been aware of what they previously accomplished, or maybe they would catch on that we were lying to them about some of their symptoms, depending on which group they were in. So we have an independent uh, measures design, which is probably also why we have 185 uh, participants in the study. You do need a lot of participants if it's independent groups. Um, so we have two dependent variables. We are measuring through observations uh, through a one-way mirror, and we are using self-reports in um, parts of the experiment. Okay, so let's go over the three aims that we were kind of looking to see, and um, then I'm going to explain the independent variables, or at least all the conditions of the independent variables, because there were seven of them. Okay, um, I try not to read this verbatim, but it's it's a long aims and propositions. So um, here we go. So the first proposition is if a person is physiologically aroused and there is no immediate explanation, the arousal will be labeled as a particular emotion based on the information around the person. So what they're saying is if we give you 
some type of arousal. In this case, it's epinephrine or adrenaline. It makes your heart race. You might sweat a little. Um, if, if you are aroused and you don't have an explanation to why, that part of the aim is saying that you're going to look to your surroundings and you're going to absorb your surroundings and you're going to say your whatever your surrounding is is making you be whether it's euphoric really happy or really sad in these cases it was one or the other okay so the second aim is if a person is physiologically aroused and there is an appropriate explanation then there is no need to seek any external stimuli or external reasons or information to further give yourself or why you're feeling that way so um, here's an example. If you just got done running a race and your heart is beating, 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 you know that, or you can assume that it's beating because you just ran the race. So you don't need to look externally for reasons to why your heart is racing. But if, if you do know why, if, I mean, if you don't know why, if you're just standing there and your heart starts racing, you're going to look around in your environment because there wasn't just an activity that you did. So, um, number two is, is like running the race. If you are told why you're receiving or you're feeling these arousals, then you're not going to look externally. So maybe if you're in the euphoric group and you're given the adrenaline shot and you're told you're going to feel anxious and have a heart rate, racing heart rate, you're maybe less likely to fall in that trap of saying that you're really happy and euphoric or fall in the trap and saying that you're really angry uh, or whatnot. Okay, so that was the second aim. Uh, now, the third aim, if there is no physiological arousal, um, then any cognition we have will dis will be dismissed and there will be no emotional experience. So this is why we have our placebo group. So they received um, an injection just as the other participants did in the experimental groups, except this group received saline, like a salt water solution. So they weren't really... Um, going to be aroused so we were hoping that because they weren't aroused they also weren't going to fall trap into saying that they were feeling really euphoric in that room or really angry in the other room okay so those were the three aims now let's get into the independent variables okay so in Shacker and singer we have two independent variables we have a physiological aspect of it and a psychological aspect so the physiological aspect is our participants um, are getting an injection of adrenaline. Now, don't forget that they believe they're getting um, saproxin. Now, saproxin is a made-up chemical. If you Google it, you'll probably get this study. Okay, so, and then the physiological, um, I'm sorry, the psychological aspect of it is either placing those participants in a room that is labeled the euphoric room, so happy, really happy and excited, or um, placing the participant in uh, the room labeled as anger. So we have um, technically seven conditions of the independent variable, and that's taking um, all the possibilities of the physiological arousal and the combinations of euphoria and anger. So we have a, an informed group, a misinformed group, an ignorant group, and a placebo group. So by I know if you do the math um, and you place four of those in the euphoric and four of those in the anger, that's eight. But for some reason, there was no misinformed anger group. Um, some research says that they originally used it as like a control condition, but it didn't elicit any results. So there was no misinformed anger group. That's really important to know. Okay, so let's go over what each condition of the independent variable actually means. So if you were part of the epi informed, and remember, Epi means epinephrine, and that is the same as adrenaline in our bodies. So epi-informed means you were given the shot of adrenaline or epinephrine, and then we told you that you were going to have symptoms that that drug would naturally elicit, like the heart rate or sweaty palms. And um, so you were completely informed about what you would be feeling. So that has to do with um, proposition number two. So if, if you know why you're feeling sweaty, then you're not going to look elsewhere to say, oh my gosh, why am I feeling this way? Oh, okay, it must be because I'm, in, I'm playing basketball or I'm hula hooping in this room with people. So we're not expecting those people to say that they are the most euphoric or the most angry or whatever. Um, epi misinformed. Um, so those participants were told symptoms not even related to what 
they would really be feeling. Like they said that they would have like numb feet, for example. All right. So we're, they're not really going to have numb feet. What they're going to feel is, is that heightened arousal and the heart rate and the sweaty palms. So when they feel that way and we didn't tell them that they felt that way, why they were, you know, that they were going to feel that way. They're going to look to their environment, hopefully to say, okay, this is why I'm feeling sweaty and anxious because, um, you know, the numb feet, I, I would understand if I felt that way because they told me I would feel that way. But the sweatiness and the palms and the heart racing, they didn't say anything about that. So I'm going to probably look to my environment to say that that's why I feel this way. And in the ignorant um, group, we told our participants that they wouldn't feel any symptoms at all um, after they received the adrenaline. So in that sense, that group as well should look to their environment for why they're feeling a certain way. Now we have a placebo group and that group again received the saline injection, but they weren't told anything because saline wasn't really going to elicit any types of um, physiological arousal as the epinephrine did. So we're going to still put them in the same environment and hope that they don't say that they are super euphoric or super angry. Okay, so this is the part where you're going to close your eyes and pretend that you are one of these um, 184 white male college students that are going to this study. Now, you are giving, you're being given an incentive to be part of this study. So you, you kind of want to go to it and you've already said yes to being injected with something. We haven't told you at this point what you're going to be injected with, but you said, yes, I will be injected. And actually what happened when they got there is one guy um, said he didn't want to be injected. So that's why we have 184 participants. So um, if you open your book and you read, there's a little monologue that all the participants heard um, prior to this about doing um, a study on a vitamin for their eyes. And the vitamin is called Saproxin. So they are going to get this injection and then they're basically going to go sit in a waiting room for 10 minutes. Um, it, that's what they're told. So we don't have full informed consent. There is deception. Um, we are causing possible physical and psychological harm because we are changing someone's physiology. Um, we do have to think about that. We did exercise the right to withdraw. We had a participant that already withdrew before it started um, and confidentiality was pretty good overall. Okay, so um, you are the participant and you get to the study and you are sitting down with a doctor and the doctor um, tells you that he's going to give you an injection and it's called Subrox Subroxin and it takes about 10 minutes or so to kick in um, and then they're going to run a series of tests and questions on you afterwards. So you get the shot and then you go sit in a waiting room. Um, the doctor leaves you there and another person comes and sits with you. Now, um, you believe that that's just another participant, but that is actually the first stooge that we see in this experiment. So it's important to know that anytime there's a stooge, um, deception is part of the study. So you have to remember that. Okay, so the next part of the study, the participants were given a vision test. Um, so this is just part of the standardized procedures that we put in place to kind of trick the participants a little bit so we could get um, more believable results and there were less demand characteristics overall. Um, so at this point, you are being placed in one of two conditions. You are going into the euphoric room um, with a stooge that is going to behave in a euphoric way or you're going to the anger room. Okay, so let's talk about the euphoric room first. In the U4 classroom, the stooge, um, at this point, he's still acting like a participant. So he goes in the room with you and he introduces himself. He has a few icebreakers. Um, you were previously told that you could kind of do whatever you wanted while you were in there. The room wasn't really nice and tidy anyway. There were rubber bands and baskets and paper all over the place. So what the stooge did was try to get our participants um, to be active and happy. So he started to crumple up pieces of paper and use the wastebasket as a basketball hoop, or um, I think there were even hula hoops in there. So there were different activities. I believe there were diff about 10 activities that the participants could have um, participated in. And there was a group of college students previous to this um, that were able to put some objective numbers on the level of activity. So for example, we would rate someone that is hula hooping as being more active than someone who is sitting at a table doodling. Okay, so there was some type of scale involved for the observers to rate our participants in their behavior. 
So just keep that in mind. So that was basically it for the euphoric room. We, um, we watched participants. Um, our stooge was completely objective in the matter because he didn't know which group the participant was coming from. It was a double blind study. So in a double blind, our participants don't know which group they're in and our observers don't know either. That just makes the, um, the results more objective because there's no predetermined, um, result that you're looking for. If you kind of know a little bit about what's going on, you're not looking for something in particular. You're completely objective until you see it. You're just reporting that objective behavioral data. Okay, so that was the euphoric classroom. Now on to the anger room. That ha that was a little bit different. So the anger classroom did happen a little bit differently. Our stooge was still there, um, but immediately upon entering the anger room, um, our participants were told that they still needed to wait about 20 minutes to let the saproxen set in. And while they did that, they were just going to fill out like a questionnaire. So our stooge was trying to get our participants in more of an angry type of mood. Um, and he automatically started to make comments about um, how unfair it was to give them shots, that they were really irritated. He would say, the hell with this. Um, and that kind of corresponded to the questions on the questionnaire that they were taking. And I'll say that the questions were a little invasive and um, they didn't do too good of a job hiding the fact that they were, they were trying to irritate our participants. So for example, here are some of the questions. Um, list the foods you would eat in a typical day. That seems fine, right? How about um, list the childhood diseases you had um, and the age that you had them. That's a, a little annoying, I would assume. How about this one? How many times a week do you have sexual intercourse? That's an invasive question. Um, with how many men other than your father has your mother had extramarital relations? <laughs> yeah, so we're trying to hit a boiling point on these individuals. And again, we're looking for the groups in the misinformed and the ignorant categories. We're looking for them to show the most emotion, to show the most anger, or to show um, the most euphoria. Now, we have to also consider that there could be demand characteristics with the group that was given the correct symptoms, um, the informed group. And we have to consider that in only the anger category because the symptoms that adrenaline is going to elicit are the heart rate and the sweaty palms. So it might cause disorientation of some sort in, in the mind or um, related to that. So we have to assume that if we tell someone, let's just say you, you wake up in the morning and you look at your little sister and her hair is all a mess and you say, you look grumpy. And it kind of sticks with her all day that she is grumpy because people keep telling her that she's grumpy all day and eventually she becomes grumpy. It's called the self-fulfilling prophecy. So if you're telling someone that they're going to feel this way that is mostly related to feeling anger, then they might even say that they are angry on the questionnaire. Um, and in the results, it's really interesting because that group did say they were the angriest. But when you look at the results from the observations, the group and the misinformed and ignorant were more that they were acting more angry than they were reporting so that that was interesting okay um now let's look at more details to Schachter and Singer okay so now that we know what our conditions consisted of let's think about how we took our data how we extracted our data other than the questionnaire in the anger group now we have uh, one-way mirrors in these rooms and we have observers back there that don't know which condition our participants are in um, but they are trying to code behavior and the best way to code is to operationally define that and that is like a very very detailed definition of what we're looking at um, in any type of behavior so I mean if you say um, every time a participant blinks we're going to make a check mark now you have to define what blink means to the T because it could be um, you know if someone blinks like this is that blinking or shutting your eyes do you have a time is, is there time is there how, how quick did it happen um, how long they shut their eyes is that a blink if one eye shuts and the other doesn't, is that a blink? Do they both have to happen at the same time? I mean, there's so many questions you could ask. So in this instant, we have to say, what are the behaviors that we're looking at and what qualifies 
us to say, yes, you that right there, that fits into um, our category. So we did have objective ways to take in this data. And for example, we have categories in the euphoric classroom and categories in the anger classroom. Um, four categories in the euphoric classroom consisted of joins in. So if someone joins in, they got a check mark. Um, if they initiated a new activity, they got a check mark. If they ignore the stooge, um, they got a check mark. And if they watch the stooge, they got a check mark. So there were four categories that we looked at to kind of um, keep track of data. And remember, our participants don't know who's in what category at this point. Now, in the anger group, there were six categories that we objectively defined as um, behavior. And this was um, agrees, if someone disagrees with another person, if they're neutral, um, if they initiate an argument or a disagreement, um, if they just sit and watch someone, if, you know, um, and if they ignore people completely. So remember, this is the ignore, um, I'm sorry, this is the anger group. So the behaviors are going to be a little bit different. We couldn't use the same categories for euphoric and anger. Now, we also had some information that was subjective. So we do have results from our self reports. And that wasn't just about the questions I asked you or I told you about before. Some of the questions on there were how angry were you on a scale of zero to four? Um, have you ever had heart palpations before and when and uh, questions that that more dealt with physiological reactions or um, psychological uh, or emotional feelings. So when in that anger group, it's important to know that they, the questions that they were asking weren't well hidden. And I believe it was close to 10 or 11. You'll have to 100% make sure. Um, participants in the anger group kind of started to figure it out. They were questioning why they were being asked such invasive questions. And, um, you know, within the portions of the experiment, we had to take them out of the study. So, so that we, our results wouldn't be influenced by their demand characteristics because they are always going to, from this point on, from now they're speculating. So from this point on, they could possibly change their behavior because they are, they know something or they assume that they know something and that's going to change their mentality. It's going to change their behavior. So we had to take the, those participants out involuntarily um, exercise their right to withdraw from the study because we knew that um, just, you know, they suspected anything, it could possibly change the way that they behaved for or answer the questions in the questionnaire for the rest of the experiment. So know that those participants um, did withdraw from the anger group. Now, the results of the study are all over the place. There are so many graphs. I'm not even sure that the book has all the graphs, but if you read the original study, it is a lengthy one. So you can look at those graphs um, or you can just stick to the findings and the results of the study to understand which aims and hypotheses that we did prove. OK, so let's just take a look at the results for the euphoric classroom. Um, we found that those in the epi informed group were less euphoric than those in the epi misinformed group. We also found that those in the epi informed group were less euphoric than the epi ignorant group. So this is just telling us that if you knew your symptoms were going to elicit some physiological arousal and the, that actually did happen, you had a reason so we're going to say that you're going to say that you're less euphoric because you're not falling victim to your environment. Um, but for the ignorant and the misinformed, um, they didn't have a reason. So our research was significant and um, the data proved our, our proposition in that case was correct. So it worked in the euphoric classroom. So in the anger classroom, the results were similar. So um, for, remember, we had observations and self-reports in the anger classroom. So for the anger self-reports, those in the epi-informed actually rated themselves as being more angry than those in the epi-ignorant group. Um, so that kind of has to do with that um, self-fulfilling prophecy I talked about earlier. If I tell you over and over again that you're going to feel a certain way, you're probably going to, you know, absorb that and write that down in 
the questionnaire, which is what we see here. But the interesting thing is it was completely switched for the observations by our um, stooges or researchers. Um, <clears throat> we saw that those in the epi ignorant group were actually behaving more irate than those in the informed group. So all of the details that we see in the results of the study is proving our hypothesis correct. And we do see significant data in our results. Okay, so let's talk about the conclusion of the study a little bit. So um, this study was done in 1962. And from that time, we have come a long way on what we believe emotions are, how we label our emotions. So when we talk about the conclusion of the study, um, Schachter and Singer truly believe that they proved all of their aims. And according to their research, they, they did. And, and that's great for science in 1962, but over, over time, we're showing that there are more factors that are going into us interpreting our emotions than just these two factors of some type of feeling and then appraising our environment. We could look at other people. Um, <clears throat> we can look at past experiences and those all contribute. It's not just our, our immediate environment that we know this now and, and research is progressing and no, I don't have an exact name for that theory right now, but Schachter and Singer did do the legwork for us to even say, hey, let's look at our surroundings to help label how we're feeling because our physiological feeling inside can be the same in many different scenarios, but we don't really know what it is until we kind of look to see what's triggering it. Now, that trigger could be visual, but it could trigger not just in the moment, it could trigger a memory or a past experience that's causing an emotion to arise. And that does happen a lot with patients with PTSD or anxiety attacks. Um, so this can really help us in the future. It can improve psychology, it can improve society because if we are able to stop in that moment of our anxiety attack and say, oh my gosh, it was that that white cat that just triggered my anxiety attack, what does a white cat have anything to do with it? And then you remember the first time you had this experience, maybe there just happened, maybe the owner of the house that you had an anxiety attack in had a white cat, who knows? But we wouldn't know that unless we knew to look for those triggers in our environment. And that is thanks to Schachter and Singer in their two factor theory of emotion. Now you should also look at the controls of the experiment, the apparatus, know a few of the materials that were used in the euphoric classroom, like the rubber bands and waste baskets and pencils and such. Um, know the controls of the experiment. They're not too detailed, but the controls are going to help with the reliability of the study overall and help with your evaluation of the study. Okay, so before we go, let's just take a look at what you really need to take away from the study. You need to understand the procedure that happened from being told that you were going to get Saproxin to having that shot and sitting in the waiting room for 10 minutes with a stooge and then you get put into euphoric or anger classroom and from there you are subject to the stooge behaving either euphorically or angry and then we have observers watching your behavior or you're taking some type of assessment in the anger classroom and we have all all this to work with, um, but what do you need to come out of the study to um, pass your exam or pass the Schachter and Singer part? So I would be able to describe the variables that we measured and know that there were seven subgroups of the independent variable. You need to know that there was no misinformed anger group. So you should also be able to describe two conclusions that happened from the study. Um, not too detailed, just two conclusions, two concluding statements um, from the study. You should be able to talk about one strength and one weakness of the biological approach as it relates to Schachter and Singer. Um, I would be able to describe at least one aim from the study. In paper one, you're not, it's not likely you'll be asked all three aims, um, like in Baron Cohen, you might not be asked all five, but you should be able to recite and rewrite one aim of Schachter and Singer. Um, and from that point on, you should be looking to evaluate these studies for things like the biological approach or nature versus nurture. 
and we'll get more into that as the year goes on as we get closer to test time so for now thank you so much for sticking with me through Shacker and Singer it is definitely one of the more difficult studies to understand so if you want me to do another video um, please let me know comment like my video subscribe to my channel I will continue to do these videos as long as you need them all right so take care thanks so much bye